I'm Hi, Adam. delighted. Hello, Lucy. I'm delighted to be joined by you. Uh, I really am because we normally open an event with, I would say, a presentation or someone maybe talking about what, what they sort of done as, as um, maybe as a rhetoric. But I think this is much more probably interactive, which I really like. So thank you for joining me, Lucy. I'm very excited by it. Um, now, the event itself, um, I'm not sure if you sort of um, look too much on the agenda, but we cover a lot of key areas from digital um, to decarbonisation. So from your perspective, and I think what I'd like to know from you first is give us a little bit of background knowledge on the Centre for Net Zero. What does it do? What do you actually work on over there, Lucy? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Adam. So Centre for Net Zero is an autonomous research unit focused on research to deliver a faster, fairer and more affordable energy transition. And our research is really attempting to provide evidence to help us all think about the future energy system. So we cover the full ecosystem of people and households, businesses, the grids and also places themselves as places that are going to deliver and uh, be the home of this energy transition. Um, we're particularly interested in a people-centred future energy system. So what I mean by this is how do people behave or how do they want to behave, uh, when and why, and how can we use that knowledge to deliver that fast, fair and affordable transition that we care about. And we're also interested um, and very relevant to, to this event in the role of technology and innovation and automation and how that will uh, really transform this whole sector. And uh, as you said, we are backed by the Octopus Energy Group. I think that's a very interesting point you made because I think probably three or four years ago, people were looking at um, decarbonisation and digital as two completely separate parts of the equation. But I think now they're amalgamating more and more uh, on the actual, on the landscape of, of energy particularly. Um, how do you see the role of data and digitalization developing for the utilities of the future? Because we're gonna hear a lot about that today, but what's your opinion on the role of, of both data and digital? Mm. Well, I think the, the entire utility sector is, is going to be transformed by both of those things. Um, I think, just as you said, the pace of that transformation isn't just going to be driven by uh, decarbonisation and emissions commitments, but I think it will also be driven by greater consumer engagements. Um, and this is increasing. And, and I think there are a couple of uh, big drivers for this. Firstly, because of the global context in relation to energy prices and also energy security, um, people are really starting to pay attention to both of those things, asking how much their energy is costing and how secure that energy supply is. But secondly, because customers are beginning to purchase and, and own or, or perhaps have some other sort of investment or interest in low carbon technologies. And, and in these cases, data and digitalization is driving more innovative customer propositions. So examples of that might be innovative tariffs where uh, the price perhaps varies uh, by the uh, carbon intensity or by the, the time that energy is used. Um, and some good examples of that that I can use from my, my Octopus affiliation are Intelligent Octopus, but also the Octopus Fan Club, which is a, uh, a tariff which is linked to onshore wind turbines and the wind speed in those local areas. Um, outside of that consumer uh, interface, um, there's also, I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, growing interest in using data and digitalization under the hood, if you like, uh, for applications like digital twins, which I think will increasingly become not just about understanding, having situational awareness of the energy system and understanding what's happening right now and helping to support the operations of the system right now, but I think that will also move increasingly into thinking about what if scenarios and resilience scenarios um, and starting to um, model and uh, simulate some of the uh, states of the system under different possible future conditions. That's very interesting you mentioned that about the technology side, because I think digital twin in particular people were talking about it a few years ago but now you can see there's a lot more of an interest in as you mentioned what if scenarios and what if this happens so a lot of predictive let's say predictive maintenance falls under that as well um 
you mentioned renewables. I mean, that's fantastic about the, the yep. wind, the wind power side. We're hearing a lot about that in the news at the moment. I think wind power in particular. And um, with renewable integration, how do you think distributed energy yep. resources will evolve? Because they will evolve. I know there's an issue with yep. intermittency of renewables. We all talk about it. Um, but what role will technology play to also decarbonize the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, firstly, I think the number of distributed energy resources in the system will increase by orders of magnitude. And that's going to be driven both by businesses, but increasingly by households. Um, as we're moving out of the early adopter phase and we're heading into mainstream adoption, and uh, just yesterday, in fact, in the UK, it was announced that the government grants to subsidise electric vehicle purchases had now ended. Um, and the reason given for that was that the market was deemed to have been kickstarted sufficiently. And that was the original purpose of that grant was to support that early adoption. So um, more distributed energy resources in the system will increase the overall complexity but I think importantly, they'll also increase the whole system's potential for flexibility and for resilience. And those are the two things that are really important for renewable integration. Um, mm. When it comes to resilience, that is first and foremost a local attribute. And so more distributed energy resources and data in the system um, will also mean that it can tend, the system itself can tend towards more localization. And the, where technology will come in here is that it will allow us to understand and optimize the future energy system for the things that are important to us. So for instance, that might be some balance of uh, carbon, some balance of cost, some balance of reliability and availability, and also equity. And um, mm. localization is relevant here because how we value those things and, and therefore what balance of those things we prefer might actually be different in different localities, different communities. So technology can play a very important role there. It's a very good answer. I think um, there's going to be more focus on households and the consumer as, um, as I think all of this moves forward as well. But how, how important, because I know there's a lot of pressure now on households. There's, you know, the, the cost of living and, and the rising price of energy is going to probably hit the roof over the next few months. Um, how important is the flexibility potential of households, let's say in the whole ecosystem of future energy systems? Yeah, uh, it's another good question. Um, it will have a role to play. Um, being able to aggregate and take advantage of domestic, domestic flexibility could really enable us to avoid um, some, some uh, potentially very high costs of grid reinforcements. Mm -hmm. Um, but it will be easier to do that if we have uh, high confidence or certainty about the amount of domestic flexibility that might be available in, in different situations. And if you think about the domestic flexibility of uh, any given household, that might be subject to quite wild variation um, because it, you know, it's likely to be a function of that particular household's activities, um, and even who's living in the house at any given point in time. Um, so for a given household, we might have fairly low confidence. Um, and it's also is likely to vary by um, the type of low carbon technology. So the flexibility we might be able to access from an electric vehicle um, could, for obvious reasons, be fairly different than the flexibility we might be able to access from an electric heat pump, uh, for instance. Um, but when we take a single household and then aggregate that household with many others who exhibit their own uh, different variabilities, we might then be able to start to draw some insights across that uh, greater population with higher confidence. Um, so for instance, the, the flexibility implications of one household perhaps being on vacation at any one point in time might actually be countered by another household's working from home, for instance. Um, and some of our analysis at Centre for Net Zero is um, to begin to explore these relationships and concepts um, so that we can make that household flexibility as useful a resource as possible in the future energy system, but also so that we can start to develop our thinking about the market structures that best, that help to best reward those, those people and those households who are contributing in some way to the, supporting the overall system. It's fantastic. It's really, it's brilliant to get this insight from you. And I think the work you're doing for 
the center for net zero is, is brilliant it's absolutely fantastic. it's going to help the consumer i think it's going to help the whole energy ecosystem so lucy it's been an honor having you thank you very much for joining me and thank you very much for opening the event with me as well thanks so much adam